you didn't win. <laughs> but you were one of the first major party nominees for Congress. And I hope that was just the beginning. I hope you're back in there. And I believe in time you can become the first Muslim ever to serve in the U.S. Congress. And that would be a great day for America. I mean, how about first Muslim and South Asian? Because there are a lot of South Asians sitting here. I was born in India, and I, was, I grew up in Pakistan. I spent more time in America, so I'm more American than anything else. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a bit headed. They will begin to see Muslims close up as human beings, instead of as stereotypes. So stay with it, Saeed. All right. All right. And Diana, enjoy okay. your comments for <laughs> on anybody's payroll, nor do I hold public office. I'm here because I want to weep for my country. Our nation is in great peril. The challenge is certainly great, but in my view, the basic goodness of the American people will surface eventually when they have the facts about the situation. So I'm not giving up. Almost all of my time since I left Congress in 19 June, January of 1783 has been spent in my quest for a just peace in the Middle East. And I must say as I read the headlines I haven't done very well, I must admit. <laughs> First, a word of introduction. I've had a lot of unique experiences. A veteran of 22 years in Congress, 65 years as a champion of human rights for all humankind. In World War II, I experienced war close up, took part in the liberation of Guam, then went to Japan. And a few days after I arrived there, I borrowed a jeep and drove to Nagasaki and walked through the rubble, just a little bit of rubble that remained, of a, an immense progressive city where more than 60,000 human beings were incinerated by a single bomb. I deplore anti-Semitism and any other form of bigotry. My proudest moments in Congress were when, in the 1960s, I could vote for the civil rights legislation. I believe deeply in the rule of law. In Congress, I offered what I call rule of law resolutions to end the Arab-Israeli War of 67, to end the war in Vietnam, and after leaving Congress, I sent a recommendation to my friend, the Foreign Minister of Iraq, Nizar Hamdoun. And in it, I expressed the hope that, that Iraq would see fit to offer to take the territorial disputes it had with Kuwait to the International Court of Justice and agree in advance to accept the decision of the court. But no one would listen, and we went to war and continued military action. They were bloody, they were costly, they were searing experiences for many people in many lands. Now America is bogged down in two guerrilla wars, wars of our making. We forget that war, that guerrilla wars, the guerrillas almost always win. Not the organized, mighty, high-tech armies, but the guerrillas that seize opportunities and make great use of them. Fundamental questions <coughs> go unanswered. Why did we invade Iraq? Iraq had nothing to do with 
imposed no threat whatever to the United States. In fact, it would not have posed a threat to the United States had it possessed weapons of mass destruction. Another why. Why was America the target of terrorists on 9-11? To my knowledge, our government has never tried to find the answer to that vital question. Were there deeply felt grievances that were left unattended? Did America do something that provoked fiery retribution? Foreigners now see us as an imperial nation. Bent on the military domination of the Middle East and beyond, our acts of war have torn two nations literally asunder. In the name of national security, our government subsidized or scuttles the doctrine of national sovereignty, the bedrock of the legal rights of nations, for more than three centuries, and that has been scuttled. Our government no longer reserves war as the act of ultimate nature to be reserved to the ver very end after all other options have been disposed. In fact, we talk about initiating more wars. Will Iran be next? Will Syria? Will it be Saudi Arabia? Abroad, our officials detain hundreds of suspected insurgents and sadly they stoop to torture in the interrogation of these people. And now our government has shifted the main camp for detention and interrogation from Guantanamo Bay to Afghanistan, conveniently beyond the reach of America's judicial system. In both Iraq and Afghanistan, we have built permanent military bases, creating local fear that U.S. forces are there to stay. Imagine the impact of all this on people abroad, especially those in the Middle East. To them, the U.S. government emerges as the latest imperial power the only substantial support we have in Iraq is from Great Britain. The last century's foremost imperial power, the nation that carved out of part of the Middle East, the state of Iraq, gave it vast promises about democracy and freedom. Then it betrayed their promises. No wonder insurgency continues. America has become the self-appointed world policeman. The world needs a policeman, but the, no nation state is equipped for that task, and none should attempt it. World policing, as the speaker said earlier today, is the task of a strong multinational force, well equipped and able to act promptly to deal with trouble spots. At home, pressure, precious liberties have been sacrificed. Our government asserts the right to imprison anyone that the president and the president alone deems a threat to our nation's security. What an enormous conveyance of power to one man. Hundreds of U.S. Muslims are rounded up for questioning and for detention for long periods on flimsy charges or in most cases no charges at all. And these arrests naturally stir the anxiety and the fear of non-Muslims add to their unwarranted notion that Muslims are dangerous people. 
According to recent polls, and I hope you have seen these because they are so important, one out of four of the American people believe that Muslims are anti-American. That's 25 percent. Forty-four percent believe that Muslims in, encourage violence, and that figure is double the percentage of the year before. It's up to 44%, almost a majority. And 46% of Americans believe that the civil liberties of U.S. Muslims should be curtailed. A Protestant clergyman, an Episcopal, Episcopalian, wrote a letter to me the other day in which he said that all U.S. Muslims should be evicted from the country. He was serious. After discarding one promise, premise after another, the president now calls the war in Iraq one to establish democracy and freedom. <laughs> Ponder this question. Could President Bush have ever rushed Congress and the American people into a war in Iraq, one costing so far about $200 billion and about 1,600 American lives and thousands of lives blighted in some serious way? Just to bring democracy and freedom to Iraq, preposterous. The president wouldn't have gotten to first base. Imagine the impact of all this. It's, it's bound to be sobering. Invading Iraq was the worst, first and worst folly in American history, exceeding all others. As a grim testament, more than 1,600 caskets containing youthful remains have been shipped from Iran, uh, from Iraq to grieving families here in America. Wounded fill the hospitals. Thousands of families in America and many thousand more families in Iraq are blighted forever. the end of the Gulf War, an incident occurred that, <coughs> that you can cite as one of the reasons why the Iraqi people don't trust our intentions. The first President Bush urged the Iraqis to have an uprising and overthrow Saddam Hussein. Maybe you remember that. And this prompted an uprising very strong. But the U.S. publicly refused to do anything to help. After inspiring the uprising, we said, hands off for us. And as a result, Saddam Hussein used gunships that we authorized him to use to slaughter dissidents by the hundreds. And for a decade <coughs> earlier, U.S. fighter planes enforced severe sanctions that led to immense civilian suffering, including the death of at least a half million Iraqi infants. Another reason why there is distrust. And beginning with the shock and wave assault that left much of Baghdad in rubbles, and the great historic city of Fallujah later on in Robles. These assaults must have an enduring impact on the lives and future actions and attitudes of the Iraqi people. I use plain language today. I say things that you may not like. 
But in these perilous times, I feel that I must speak the truth as I know it to be. America was once revered worldwide. Yes, worldwide. And especially in the Middle East. And now we are reviled worldwide. From being revered to reviled. And the American people seem unaware of this grim reality. We also ignore the dangerous reality that Middle East policy is not designed by U.S. officials. It is the creation of two religious communities here in America, communities that have attained great political power. Now you may, you may think I'm treading on dangerous territory. I am, but it's high time that someone spoke out. If we are to emerge from peril, we must face openly and critically the role of these two religious groups in the formation of policy in the Middle East. If we keep tiptoeing around the subject, we risk even greater peril in the future. For over 35 years, our government has engaged by proxy in a war that has to be described as a war of territorial conquest. We continue this proxy war today, and we've added two wars that we ourselves initiated on top of it. We invaded Afghanistan, we invaded Iraq. Both invasion, invasions can be traced to our government's passionate attachment to the state of Israel. Yeah. This group is enormous. It consists probably of over 70 million Americans. Without this group's support, George Bush would never have been re-elected in 2004. The groups make strange bedfellows. Jewish doctrine makes no mention of Jesus Christ. And Christian fundamentals predict the destruction or conversion to Christianity of all Jews the moment Jesus Christ returns to earth. But they are bound together by an immediate interest, the survival of the strong, expanding Israel, as an essential precondition to the arrival of their own separate messiahs. Are you aware of this? The American people certainly are not. Ultra-Orthodox Jews believe their Messiah will not come until greater Israel, that is, biblical Israel, comes into being. And they believe that it would be against their faith to permit even a square mile of Palestine to be reserved as a homeland for the Palestinians. They exert power far beyond their numbers, both in Israel and in America. In Israel, they are the primary force <coughs> be, be behind the construction and expansion of settlements on Palestinian territory, an expansion that goes forward to this very day. Fundamentalist Christians in America help finance the transfer of Jews from America, mostly from New York, to these settlements. Christian groups are financing the building of settlements in Palestine. These groups are so politically powerful 